not the civil government. Most Christians would readily agree that the moral laws of God, and particularly the Ten Commandments, provide moral instruction and a standard by which to judge whether our faith is borne out by our works. But other questions inevitably arise. What about the ungodly and the sinner? How can we expect the unconverted to obey the high standards of God's law? What about followers of other religions? Wouldn't we be forcing our beliefs on them? These are certainly valid questions. And in this segment, we'll deal with this issue. Would a Christian republic which upholds God's law become oppressive to non-Christians, or would there be greater freedom for all? In Deuteronomy 8.4, we read the reference, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was speaking to Israel, and there to understand in that the revelation of God. Interestingly, our Lord Jesus Christ, when he's defending himself against Satan, he tells Satan, man shall not live by bread alone. Don't tempt me with your bread. My ultimate food, my ultimate bread is the Word of God. Indeed, it's every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we have a total God who has created a total universe and lays upon us a total obligation to love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and he expects us to be committed to his total word by every word that proceeds out of his mouth, properly interpreted and applied, of course, not just taking things out of context, but properly interpreted. Every word from God is to teach us the things of God and is an obligation to us. In John 18, 36, as, as uh, Christ is standing before Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world, else would my servants fight. Interestingly, when he says that, just prior to that, Pilate asked him, are you a king? Jesus says, where did you hear that? Did others tell you, or is this from yourself? That question there really throws a lot of light on what his response is. For what Christ is doing is standing against misinterpretations of what he has said, like the Jews who wanted to come and take him by force in John 6.15 to make him a political king, they misunderstood the redemptive spiritual aspect of the kingdom and the whole nature of the kingdom. And so Jesus asked Pilate, if you heard this from the Jews who are accusing me, you don't know what kind of kingdom I'm talking about. My kingdom is one whose source is in heaven. It's not of this world. It's not one that requires servants that fight, that is, armies. My kingdom's not that kind at all. It comes not with swords loud clashing. My kingdom, and he goes on to say, is related to truth. And um, so the kingdom that he establishes is a, is a kingdom in a different sphere. Christ's kingdom can theoretically coexist with American government and with other governments. It's not necessarily contradictory to it. Of course, they come into conflict because of sin, but nevertheless, governments, bureaucratic entities with police forces and armies and judicial systems are not contrary to the kingdom of Christ. It is a redemptive reality that is the heartbeat of a culture. It's not the external trappings uh, of a culture. So in John 8, 18, 36, when Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world, the context in which he is speaking is a context of the accusations that he has come to set up a political kingdom which would force uh, Pilate to actually put him to death, which we know that he did, but Pilate even said, this man is not guilty. His blood be upon you. It's not on my hands. And so that is what Jesus is referring to. He's distinguishing his inner redemptive spiritual kingdom from an external uh, physical kingdom such as Rome has uh, surrounding the Jews. God has given great wisdom to all mankind on how to run life, how to run families, how to run governments how to have just courts and just laws in the Bible and that the Bible is the owner's manual that comes with the machine. He certainly knows more than all of us put together what makes us run well and what would make a good society, what would make a prosperous, joyful, peaceful, orderly society. 
Well, we believe he's given us these laws in the Bible, principles and laws in the Bible, and we also can prove from looking at history that this already worked marvelously wherever they seriously attempted it. It worked in uh, Geneva, in Scotland, to a certain degree in England. It worked marvelously here in America in the 1600s and 1700s, and even into the early 1800s. Now, when saying that America did a great job in the 1600s, 1700s, early 1800s, I don't mean there were not problems, and it's not that we want to duplicate everything they did. We would want to very definitely eliminate slavery right from the beginning. It should have been done at the Constitution, and uh, we're sorry it didn't. It was our very bad mistake, and that's, there's no excuse for that. That needs to be repented of, but uh, compared with any other society in history, there has never been such freedom for blacks, whites, or women uh, in the world as we had here. The biblically thinking women and the biblically thinking blacks and Indians, uh, Chinese, Jews, anybody uh, that would be considered an ethnic group, or a, a, a group, a gender group, the clear thinking biblical people in those groups say the same thing. It's not the clear thinking biblical people in those groups who would have trouble with this. Uh, we want the federal government to be limited to its delegated, enumerated powers. Uh, we do not want to subsidize our perspective by giving money to organizations or individuals who are using the courts or who are lobbyists or who are editorial writers or who are securing government grants to advance our agenda. We simply want to stop others from requiring us to send our tax dollars to Washington to advance uh, their agenda. If you do it our way, instead of supporting a Leviathan government which costs you two trillion dollars a year, uh, you'll be able to keep your own money. You won't have to pay a penny in income tax, sales tax, inheritance tax, capital gains tax, business tax, social security will be privatized, the federal government will get out of the land business, federal expenditures will be less than five hundred billion dollars a year and the government will support itself the way it did for most of our history through excises imposts duties and apportionment among the states we think that uh, if people see that they can be free again that they do not have to have one spouse working to support the government while the other spouse works to support the family that they will rally behind this kind of approach this is not uh, moral imperialism, this is liberty. I would encourage those who believe in ghettoizing their faith uh, to listen carefully as they recite the Lord's Prayer, which talks about building his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Our job is to occupy until he comes. And uh, there, is, uh, there is nothing in scripture which can uh, be cited as an excuse for not doing our duty to seek his justice and his glory. Law is the will of the sovereign for his subjects. Thus, law represents the word of the God of a society. Now, whose law you have, he is your God. So if Washington makes our laws, Washington is our God. And as Christians, we cannot believe that. For untold centuries, God's law has functioned wherever God's people have been, whether in Israel or in Christendom. This is a new and a modern thing that we turn to the state's law. One professor of law, dean in fact of a law school, told me a few years back that he found that in, even into the 1840s, courts in the United States decided cases, as did juries, out of the Bible, out of God's word, out of his law, because he was God. 
But now we do not recognize God as God over the United States. The oath of office in Washington for the president used to be taken on an open Bible turned to Deuteronomy 28, invoking all the curses of God for disobedience to his law and all the blessings of God for obedience to his law. Now basically you can have two kinds of law. Theonomy, God's law, or autonomy, self-law. That's what it boils down to. An autonomy leads to anarchy, which is what we're getting increasingly. Adoption of theonomy will ensure the blessings of God according to the book of Deuteronomy and elsewhere. A people whose ethical foundation is the law of God are promised the blessings of God. But even if we want to speak pragmatically, theonomy would drastically reduce the size of our federal government, state governments, and even municipal governments. Uh, it would get the civil government out of our lives. It would destroy all sorts of these uh, messianic regulatory agencies. So in a theonomic society, the vast majority of people who lived in it would be very happy to live there. I mean, the tax man wouldn't be uh, seizing nearly as much money. And if people actually knew what the law of God taught, most people would be in favor of that because it would decentralize our civil government. It would punish those who need to be punished. Um, and the whole general situation in society would be much improved. Of course, that's not the idea that is set forth by many of our liberal opponents who think that we're out to seize political control to produce some radical social change. That's what they do. They seize political control for radical social change. We're not in favor of that. We believe that society is much greater than politics. Politics is only a small part of society. We believe that godly change comes through regeneration, through godly families, godly churches, intermediate uh, private institutions having nothing to do with the civil government and uh, volunteer work and that sort of thing. So we're not looking for some Ayatollah Khomeini uh, civil government. We're, up at the, we're at the opposite end of the spectrum from that. And the biblical principle of removing evil, uh, evil incrementally, little by little, is set forth in God's instructions to Joshua and, of course, uh, his predecessor Moses. So in these cases, I think it's necessary to first for the church to educate the populace about the truth of the Word of God. Uh, the church is much more important than the state, although it has uh, separate functions just as the family does. So I need to make clear that we Christian Reconstructionists don't believe that all in one day or even in one month or even one year or ten years or perhaps even a century we're able to enforce the law of God as we would like to. Uh, we've been in an era of apostasy in this country for at least 150 years. We can't expect to turn things around overnight. It's been said, either man will be governed by the Ten Commandments or he'll be governed by the Ten Thousand Commandments. And I submit to you that the growth of the bureaucracy in America, the growth of all these bizarre laws that govern so many aspects of our lives, is because our culture and our government have rejected the law of God and become a, a law unto themselves. They're pretenders to the throne of God. But they don't have Ten Commandments, they've got Ten Thousand Commandments. It's interesting to note that most of the Ten Commandments are negative. You shall not, you shall not. And that is generally the purpose of law. It's to proscribe or to stop evil behavior. But the purpose of law is not to mandate good behavior. That concept comes from the French Revolution. Equality, liberty, fraternity, or death. You're going to be good. You're going to give money to other people. You're going to help other people do this or that. Or if not, we'll kill you or we'll put you in prison. And much of American law today is the direct opposite of the Ten Commandments. It's the government forcing you to give your money to things you don't believe in to have your labor go to projects that you don't believe in or that might be inherently immoral. Look at the Old Testament and the freedom that it gave. Look at American law today, having departed from much of its Christian roots, and you've got these constant intrusions into our lives, them forcing us to be good. You will give your money to this program. You will give your labor to that program. You will do this. You will do that. It's, it's way more like the French Revolution than it is Christian liberty. And the end result is 
that we become the servile subjects of the great savior state, the divine state, who tells us everything we have to do in our businesses and our families, even what pastors can and can't preach from the church pulpit, for goodness sake. This is not freedom. Freedom, liberty, has one chief end, and that is to advance Christ's rule, his reign over all the nations and all the realms of the earth. Now, liberty, without the sure anchor of Christian orthodoxy, uh, is really a Greco-Roman idea. And it leads either on one hand to unfettered licentiousness and anarchy, a moral anarchy on one hand, or on the other, a paternalistic tyranny. Because when you have moral anarchy, the state will move to suppress that anarchy. So without Christian orthodoxy, the hope of freedom and liberty that our founding fathers fought for it's elusive at best. When autonomous man seeks liberty from God, his first action is to revolt against God's law in order to fulfill the lusts of his flesh. Thereafter, during this period of anarchy, the state, the messianic state, seeks to suppress this moral anarchy. At that point, you have tyranny. You have the liberal or the right wing imposing their own morality apart from God. And so the whole issue of liberty is connected intrinsically to the idea of God's moral law. Liberty apart from God's law is an impossibility. There is no neutrality on this issue. It's either God's law or chaos. And if we have chaos, we will have tyranny. You see, God has designed all governments, whether they are fascistic, communist, or democratic republics, to gravitate towards stability. The only question there is, will it be the governance of God's law, or communism, or fascism, or any other man-centered humanistic ideal? And so man can have his licentious, lust-filled day in the sun, but he will pay a price. It will be in the ultimate loss of all freedom. It's no accident or coincidence that apostasy and heresy within the church and civil tyranny among nations walk hand in hand. The orthodox expression of Christianity is the final guarantor of our freedoms. And so if through heresy or infidelity to orthodoxy gains the ascendancy within the church, it's going to eventually work its way out into the civil sphere. People often ask me, why is it that we have such oppressive government in America today? And my answer is, don't point to Washington, D.C., because while it is Sodom on the Potomac, the real answer, the real problem, the real difficulty lies in the pulpits of America. Unless we affirm Christian orthodoxy and the resultant freedoms it has birthed and has guaranteed throughout the years, we will continue to be enslaved by our status masters. We do have laws on the book that parallel biblical law. Rape, for example. Rape is on the book. You, you don't rape people. It's on the book. But that's in the Bible, too. And we take that, we take that and apply, we, apply, we apply the law regarding rape to non-believers. Uh, and no one seems to have trouble with that. The Bible says you don't trip a blind person. Uh, well, we, we impose that on people all the time. Uh, we, we have, uh, in fact, uh, I would make an application to something like that with these parking spaces, for example, for handicapped people. We make it, we, we've made it more accessible for people who have handicaps based upon that. We've taken a principle out of the Bible and have applied that. Uh, railing around the rooftop. Uh, we're here at a church that has a balcony, and w there's a railing up around that balcony. There's a law that's applied to anybody who comes in here. So I think it's a myth to say that you can't take laws out of the Bible and apply it. I think the confusion comes in when people think that you take laws re regarding um, uh, worship and so forth and force those on people. There's nothing in the Bible that says that a person has to go to church or a person, you must force a person to come to Christ. You must force a person to uh, take the Lord's Supper. You must force a person to be baptized. These are all ecclesiastical laws that don't apply to unbelievers and there's no force upon them for that. How do you determine when you've murdered somebody? What's the, how do you determine between first degree and second degree murder? How do you, how do you separate those from accidental death? How, do, how would you then dis distinguish between uh, first degree murder, second degree murder, accidental death, and um, putting somebody to death because of murder? How would you then distinguish those four things with war? Well, you can't. 
But the Bible does. The Bible makes it very clear the difference between first degree and second degree murder. The difference between lying in wait for somebody and then accidentally killing somebody because of negligence or just someone dying because of an accident. And it also makes, it put, sets parameters concerning war. Uh, we tell people they're not supposed to lie. People lie all the time. But when you do it under certain circumstances, for example, perjury, uh, we've, again, we've just gone through all this thing about perjury. And the Bible talks about perjury. We apply it to everybody who sits on a, on a jury. A perjury is reality. So I just think it's a myth for people to make that kind of claim. When we do it all the day right now, we seem to be pretty successful at it. You have to understand a couple of things to understand these capital cases. Uh, number one, be put to death. No ransom, no plea bargaining in the matter of murder. Now in these other cases, we have the expression of God's wrath and vengeance on these sins that are appropriate in a, a covenant-keeping culture that is in a, in a faith environment where people are self-consciously committed to the Lord and His law, and B, in cases where there's a flagrant in-your-face violation. So th there's not really too much to fear. <clears throat> Even if the law was administered, it would have the result of driving homosexuality underground, which is exactly where the law of God would keep it. Now, the converse of this is uh, what we face in our days, not so much a danger of homosexuals being killed, but a danger of Christians being killed in our nation, or at least persecuted and segregated, because only one group can occupy a prominent place in the public square. It's either going to be God's people out there enjoying the neighborhoods, breathing the air, or it's going to be God's enemies owning the public square and polluting it. It's not ever both. The righteous hate the wicked, and the wicked hate the righteous, it says in the Proverbs, and that's simply a truism. So which would we rather have governing the public square, righteousness or wickedness? I know when I look now, I see wickedness. When we start to try and pick and choose between which moral standards we will adhere to and which ones we won't, we ultimately set ourselves up as judges over God and judges over all of the testimony of history. If we start to pick and choose which parts of the Old Testament law we like and don't like, which parts we think are judgmental and which parts we think are, are helpful, we have essentially established man as the ultimate standard, the ultimate arbiter of, of all of law. That means that we are ultimately vulnerable to whoever is in power, whoever has control, whoever is able to, to wield the most authority in a society. That puts us all in a very vulnerable state. I, I, I don't know about the rest of the world, but, uh, but I, for one, would much rather be judged by God than by some man. Uh, that I do not know. I I'd much rather be judged by the merciful, loving, majestic creator of heaven and earth uh, than by an accumulation of, of men, however wise they may be, however educated they may be. The, the foolishness of, of Christians in our day uh, to, de to negate God's law in favor of politics is absolutely frightening. It's absolutely frightening. What we're saying is that we would actually prefer man-made law, man-made ideas, man-made concepts, man-made authority over God. Didn't we have enough of that with Hitler? Haven't we seen enough of that with Mao? Haven't we seen enough of that with Idi Amin and Pol Pot? Haven't we seen enough of that with Stalin? Do we really want to live under Napoleon, Charlemagne, Justinian? I, for one, uh, for, for all of the reality that comes to me every day as a sinner condemned by the law of God, I, for one, would much rather choose God as my judge than some man. In the history of the world, societies that adhere to biblical principles are always the most free, economically, socially, culturally, racially. Those are the societies that are free. If we want freedom, opt for, for the freedom-giving, liberty-giving standards of Almighty God. If, on the other hand, you like the record of Stalinism or Leninism or Nazism or, or Maoism, then, then go ahead and walk down the path of, of the, uh, the wisdom of the 51%, the wisdom that uh, flows out of the barrel of a gun.
We must accept this simple principle. God rules. His law is supreme and he requires all men in all nations and at all times to obey his laws. And when his law and man's law conflict, his law is the unquestionable authority. Man's law at that point is unrighteous tyranny. Now if you doubt this conclusion, please consider these questions. Whose law is eternal, God's or man's? Can God's law be rescinded, revised, or improved upon? Does God hold his law or man's law to be higher when the two are in conflict? Does God want his people to obey his law or man's when the two are in conflict? Does God hold all rulers in all nations, including non-Christians, accountable to his law, or are the lost free to do what they want? If the lost are free to do as they please, to what standard will God hold them accountable? By what standard will he judge them? How can the Holy Spirit convict them of sin if the measure of sin, the law, has been removed? We need to forever settle in our minds and hearts the supremacy of God's law. For man's law to be legitimate, it must be granted in the scriptures. Any other foundation will crumble. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not. And if our culture is going to survive, every power base must be rebuilt on the bedrock of the Bible.